happens. I want to make it really clear to people how you work, yep. how it all works. Yes, yeah. Well, for a start, I think a good point to make is Tabash is not my higher self. You talk about us all being gods. You take the concept of God, you know, as Blair was saying before, it's a state of consciousness, but it, it, it is a state of being. And, and so, so people create these rules and complications, like tying up all these knots all of the time, basically. Blair Styra, welcome Paul back. Paul Williams. <laughs> <laughs> we got used to this now, haven't we? We have indeed. <laughs> well, today is going to be really special because we're going to be bringing through Tabash. Correct, yes. Do you want to talk to people about Tabash, how long you've been doing this and just how it works because yep. I know people hear the word channeling and, and, and it can bring up some misperceptions. I want to mm. make it really clear to people how you work, yep. how it all works. Yes, yeah. Well, for a start, I think a good point to make is Tabash is not my higher self. Tabash is not an aspect of myself. Yeah. So he's definitely a separate vibration, a separate entity. And I've been channeling him publicly for um, 36 years. Um, when I first connected with him, I'd actually been channeling for about two years, but not publicly. And I had discovered I had this ability. And I suppose looking back now, that was my sort of preparation time. Um, allowing my physical to become used to working with the higher frequency that is spirit. And I suppose too, it was a bit like a testing out ground, or maybe they were testing me out, you know, is that a suitable body for to have been able to do this? So during those initial years, I just went through a real orientation of working with high levels of consciousness and development of Blair, mind, body, and spirit, and that's when spirit started to give me insights of who I am and what I needed to do and things I needed to change, etc. So I'll explain how I actually came in touch with Tabash first. Please do. So we'd been overseas, and I was looking at career choices because up to that point, I'd done lots of different things. I worked in retail, I had a restaurant, and lots what of different things. Food? What sort of food? What sort of food? It was Italian, actually. Oh, my favorite. <laughs> so, yeah. And um, I was actually thinking about a, a medical career. So, got back to New Zealand and hadn't done anything serious about, you know, taking steps towards medicine. Anyway, I was looking through the paper and I saw this ad, and it was for uh, an event that was being held, and it was a woman who's a channel, and she channeled the Egyptian goddess Isis. And I said to Kay, oh, that's interesting, let's check this out. So I had been channeling up to this point, but just never thinking for a moment I was gonna do anything like this for a career. It's just part of my self-development. So we went to this meeting and I like to sit sort of at the back on, on an aisle in case I need to escape. <laughs> I do that even in movies, you know, but not like this, um, easy exit. So I, I did that and NK was sitting next to me. So ISIS came through and, and yeah, really quite basic, simple, but interesting, you know, information that was coming through. And then suddenly ISIS stopped and she was staring into the audience. And then she pointed and she goes, you are a channel. Well, I didn't think she was talking about me. I thought she was talking about some dude behind me. <laughs> so I'm like, oh yeah, that's cool. And then Isis goes, no, 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 not him, you. And of course, everyone turns around and looks at me. So I'm like, oh God. <laughs> and um, long and short of it, we, ran, we went to some of the seminars that she was running and that just really aligned me to all these like-minded people. And I'd never seen anything like it before. And, and suddenly here was this, you know, 40 people who all believed in, in the same thing. And it was really amazing, it was really wonderful, you know. It was just like, you know, 
people will understand. It was really like meeting your family, but your soul family. So I think we must have done about three or four of these seminars over the years. And then one day, um, ISIS said to me, oh, you've got an entity called Tabash who would love to channel through you. So it was ISIS that yeah, who told gave me. you the name yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and specific Which gave me the full name, which was Tabash Salam Maham. Wow. That was his full name. Now, and who was he? I'm sorry? Who was he? Oh, right, yeah. So I'll tell you the story and then I'll explain yeah. who he was. So, um, again, it just it made sense to me. So I started just doing some meditation. And to begin with, all I saw was a picture of him in my mind's eye. I didn't hear anything or anything of that nature. And that's how it was for a long time. And then as time progressed and I could just feel, it was like he was introducing his energy into me and or to me. And I could feel his presence often and I'd have these meditations and I just knew he was there. And then I started getting other types of visuals in my head. And, and Tabash just started to talk to me a little bit about you know, what he needed me to do and guidance, etc., etc. So, I mean, this went on for months and months and months and months. And again, never thinking that I'm going to be doing this as a job. So, I was in a meditation and I was having the most extraordinary feeling in this meditation. It was real bliss. And then Tabash suddenly says in my head, open your eyes. And I resisted because I was in such a nice blissful place. And then he said, no, open your eyes. So I, thought, no. so I did, <laughs> and I wasn't in the room. My whole consciousness had shifted away from you know, the room I was in at home, and I was in spirit. And it didn't feel out of the norm to me. It was so that a, was the first time you yep. experienced being in this yeah, yeah, totally. different dimension. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, in that way. And did it seem like what we experience now? Oh, look, now? I was, I was, was, I was, it was funny because I, I found myself, I was sitting on a black and white marble floor and there was all these windows on the right to me full of light. And then I looked up and there was Tabash standing right in front of me and, and in his way of, of putting things. He just laughed and said, why are you sitting on the floor, Blair? <laughs> like this. So he goes, up, up. So I stood up and he said, I want to talk to you about what we're going to do. So we went out this door into this little um, balcony area where there's a big sofa. And we sat down and Tabash just started talking about all the work we could do and, and um, the way it could help the world and people and again, this is what you need to do and think and feel. And, and it was never um, insistent. It was like, he was just telling me what the possibilities were because invariably at the end of the day, it was still my choice. But again, it just felt, oh yeah, I know this. It's like I had obviously made this agreement and, and now I was remembering this basically, see. And then, uh, yeah, from that time on, then um, he started channeling through me. And, and so he and Kay would, would, would sit and Tabash would just chat away about stuff. And that was just getting used to, me getting used to working on this, on this level, basically, see. And in those days, Tabash was just, um, he's quieter than he is today. <laughs> so <laughs> my body would just be totally, un, uh, he'd be sitting in the chair, eyes would be closed, and, and he would just be talking. And, and that's when I, I asked him, you know, well, what's your history? And so he came from Sumeria, which is where Iraq and Iran are of today. And that was 5000 BC. And he was just a man of his time who became aware and, and understood that life is mind, body and spirit. And so it just changed his life. And so as a soul, he pledged that he wanted to serve. And, and so, you know, we obviously, as souls, made an agreement to, to do what we're doing now. Now, are you aware of him having any incarnations on the earth since that time, or is he? That was his final incarnation. Has he done this with other individuals no. over time? No. So you no. really yep. the first yep. Yep. time he's come back through into this reality. Yep. Absolutely, yeah. And, yep. you know, someone's even asked me, does he channel through anyone else now? And I said no, because I know there are entities who do channel through similar, uh, various other channels on the, on the planet, but Tabash, I'm um, his solo channel. 
Yeah. So. Well, I know you shared with me your own personal experience with, and a lot of people will be familiar with her, Esther Hicks, yes. who yep. channels Abraham. What was your experience with her? I know you met her, right? Or you were on a yeah. cruise with her. Yeah, well, I, I mean, we're, we're not acquainted in any friendship way, but um, yeah, I, met, I was quite connected to the people who organized her seminars on, on cruise ships. So I did two Esther Hicks uh, cruises. And yeah, it just, the, the information that was coming through and the way she channeled was quite similar to, to how Tabash works, basically. And, um, and I liked her just common sense way of approaching things. And, and yet she's probably a lot more um, distant, whereas Tabash is a lot more gregarious and, and you know, he'll go into the audience and hug people and stuff like that, where she'll tend to stay on the stage. And I notice she even takes her shoes off yes, when yep. she does that. I, yep. Is that yep. to ground, do you think, and, and connect? Probably for comfort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> don't know what type of shoes she wears. Maybe she's... Yeah, well, there's a point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Um, yeah, so it was quite a few years of, of um, working with Tabash without doing anything public. And some of that was to do with me because you know, I'm quite a logical person in, in many ways. And I just wanted to make sure that what I was working with was real and, and I felt really good about it. So um, it's not that I doubted it, but, but I just didn't want to go public with anything and make a complete fool of myself. I know from experience mm. uh, with our own analytical minds, yep. it can be really hard to integrate some yes. of this higher knowledge, yep. higher awareness. Yep. I think we all go through times of doubting mm. or questioning. I never doubted the knowledge. It was, it was just more, well, I don't want to, you know, suddenly present myself in, in this particular way. Because, I mean, we're talking about the late 80s, early 90s here where... You know, when someone said, you know, you're a channel, people would look at you like you're lifting of the top floor or mm -hmm. something. And, 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 and so was today, you know, people go, oh, yeah. And, and so, yeah, I just didn't want to, you know, put myself into that position. So, and also too, I, I just wanted to make sure that Tabash was coming through in the best way he felt he could. And right from the beginning, I knew that he wanted to use my eyes because not all channels do that. So a lot of channels, you know, their eyes are closed and information comes up. But Tabash had said to me, oh, no, I want to use your body totally, but we have to develop the, the energy through your system. And so imagine Kay and Tabash sitting in the middle of winter in front of our fireplace at home, and they're having their sort of evening chat, you know. And um, up to that point, Tabash could see without opening my eyes. He would stand up and poke the fire and stuff like this, you see. Anyway, so Kay had been chatting away about something, and uh, she she said she got into the habit of just sort of just doing things, you know, because she didn't think, you know, you could see, so she's filing her nails and <laughs> stuff like this. Anyway, so Tabash, well, Kay had said something, and Tabash had been leaning down, and he stood up and looked, and he had opened the eyes, and 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 he looked right at her like this, you see, and she just about fell off a chair. And um, she said it was the weirdest experience because I knew it wasn't you in there, you know, because bang, you know, you just had to look at the eyes. So she could see a physical change oh, totally. in your yeah, eyes. Absolutely. Is it a colouring thing or just um, Sometimes it can happen. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even now people remark that, you know, when I'm channeling Tabash, my eyes can change. I mean, I have green eyes. They have gone different shades. They can go darker. They can go brighter. Um, one woman said they turn violet. You know, and which I said, I wish you'd taken a photo. That would have been interesting <laughs> yeah. to see. My eyes have been photoshopped or something by spirit. Um, yeah, it, it, I often get quite shiny when I channel spirit. And when I've asked spirit about that, they just said, God's light shines through your body. So you just get this glow that, 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 that happens. So, um, and then, yeah, once Tabash became a lot more animated, um, he then said to me, right, I want you to book her. A, a, a place where we can do a meeting and and so I had no idea how many people would turn up so I booked this place and a hundred people came and and I, I remember so clearly my heart rate was just going like, like this and um, just walking up center and um, then Tabash came through did an amazing teaching 
and, and I suppose in a way that's where the cork was pulled and then we started doing um, a lot of public teachings and meditation evenings. I got, started to get invited to speak. Um, one of the things, the local spiritualist churches in, in Wellington um, heard about us and they asked if we could you know, come and, and speak at their meetings. And of course they obviously being used to psychics and mediums and that type of individual. Um, you know, where someone would come up to someone and say, can I come to you please? You know, whereas if Tabash wanted to tell somebody something, he would just go up to them and say, when are you going to get your relationship sorted? <laughs> you know, like this. So the very direct approach. And then, um, yeah, we did all these public meetings and teachings and, um, oh, public wise, we started to be interviewed and on radio and TV and that type of thing. Mm. Well, I remember I was watching a recent video of Dolores Cannon share and she actually said, and I, I was going to ask you of that, but so I haven't had an opportunity to. She said there was some Hollywood connection forming or Hollywood was, was very interested in Tabash and this. I don't know what she was quite referring to back then, but it must have been quite a number of years ago. And yeah, there was, yeah, maybe yeah. you were connected to people that were... Oh, well, there was connect- always people in the... Um, entertainment. Entertainment industry and, and um, um, you know, you, you connect up with certain people who have ideas about stuff and things like that. I mean, that door's not closed, you know, but, but it's... Well, she almost <coughs> said it as a premonition of something I think okay, she yeah. was tapping into that, yeah, that maybe yeah. hasn't happened yet, but yeah, yeah, some yeah. connection there yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, well, it's interesting you say that because there's certain doors that are being opened at the moment, so, yeah. so something's definitely happening. I can feel Dolores now talking to me. Well, I got, <laughs> she's, she's I got the goosebumps like, as she said that, so I, I feel like that's, that's yeah. something that maybe hasn't happened yeah, yet. Yep. Yeah. Yep, so, yeah. Well, shall I bring Tabash through? Let's bring Tabash through and, okay. and yeah. have a chat. I'll see you when you get okay. back. Okay, yeah. So, um, as you know, it won't take long. Um, so, just have a good time and we'll talk to you afterwards. I'll talk okay, to you later. <coughs> click, click. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. Now you'll notice I'm staring into your eyes to see the changes. There you go. <laughs> eyes, I don't have eyes. <laughs> well, apparently you use the eyes and often channels don't like to do so. Yep. It's a personal thing. I, I think also to, you know, one of my things about doing what I'm doing is I really like to engage with people. How can you engage with someone you're sitting there looking like this? <laughs> you yes. know, and, and, and so it, it, it becomes more direct. I like that direct approach. So, but also, too, you know, what do they say? The eyes are the windows of the soul. Mm. So therefore, you know, but in this case, it's not just the soul. It, it, it's God mm. shining through the eyes, basically. Yeah. Well, and it's a consciousness, isn't it? Because we, me and Blair, had a chat earlier yep. about the concept of God and what God means different things to a lot of people. Mm. You talk about us all being gods, Correct. that we embody yep. that dimension within us all. Yes. It's not limited to yes. yep. one individual or another. Yep. It's something that yep. we all are and have, right? You take the concept of God, you know, as Blair was saying before, it's a state of consciousness, but it, it, it is a state of being. You know, and God doesn't think because, you know, God's beyond thinking, you know, and it's just this concept of, of vibration and energy that's forever just, you know, pulling into itself and expanding upon itself. And, and, and so, so when the God energy established everything that you humans know, then you were created as God. So you're exactly the same. You have exactly the same aptitude and, and, and power. And of course, put that into your human nature, and 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 then you bring about all your issues, etc. And and so, so of course, with humanity making these changes now, uh, the way I put it, you become more God in your nature than human in your nature. And when you allow that to happen, and then you just simply go into the part of you that has the power, you know, to redirect your human nature in the highest possible ways, basically. You see, and this is what this time in history is all about. Live in the highest idea. Live in the highest ways. 
you know, and not just live it, but think it and feel it. But every individual to define exactly what higher means to them. So there's, so there's no general higher energy. It, 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 it's a personal experience, basically. So as I say, do what you can, how you can, in the way you can. So you walked the earth a long time ago, mm -hmm. and we're 2023 now. Yeah. Why did you choose this time in history to come through? Because of what's happening. You know, and don't forget that um, when you're in spirit, um, and there is no time, but you're able to see all the possibilities of what's going to occur. I could have gone to other dimensions, you know, but I chose this one because how exciting. Look at what Earth is going to be doing in 2023. And, and the changes and the evolution and also because, you know, I, I realized, well, hey, what a grand way to serve and, and, and to bring forth information to help people turn lights on. Mm -hmm. And I mean, obviously, I'm not the only entity who's doing this, you know, it, it's, it's worldwide in lots of different ways. And, and so therefore, it, it's, I mean, what is happening on this planet has never happened before. In no. other dimensions as well? No, absolutely. So this is a very unique experience for anyone to be on this planet. I think it's why it's good to remind yourselves also that as souls, you've all chosen to be alive at this time in history because of what's happening, because you want to accelerate your development, your growth. You're looking at who am I, you know, and, and, and reorganizing yourself. So the amount of power that's available to all beings it's just there and and so it's just this sense of well that's not productive this is so you begin to change your own states of consciousness and you know humanity when you look through history you know the struggles that it has gone through to get to this point is because it's weighed itself too heavily into its human nature and so when you begin to embrace your higher nature, then you just find the balance. And when you find the balance, then you have more choices. And when you have more choices, you can make a better life for yourself. But of course, that's challenging for people to, to be able to do that. And like I said yesterday, when you turn the lights on, sometimes it's like, oh, bagger. You know, what, what am I seeing? Do I want to see that? No, I don't want to see that. Turn that light off, please. <laughs> well, you know... It is a unique time, as you said, and I agree with that. For the purposes of the people watching, how does that look? What really is so unique and what different things will we be seeing in these years ahead? What can we expect? I think first and foremost, you begin to see a very powerful collaboration amongst people and where human nature really starts putting all the differences aside and understands that if we maintain our separateness, then in human terms, we won't survive because we've stepped so far away from everything that is natural to us. And, and, and so, so when you bring this collaboration and get back into harmony, then you once again take your natural place in the scheme of, of life. And, and in doing so, then you start to become a productive component once again on this planet. Because let's face it, humanity has not been particularly productive as a component no. you know, on this planet with regards to its exploitation and its conflict, etc. And, and so, so when you move away from that and you move into this positive collectivity, well, then you bring the balance back in. And then that's how, you know, humanity has to live in harmony with itself before it can live in harmony with anything else, basically. As within, so without, right? Of course. So we have to first experience that before yes. Yes. we see that as yes. an outward expression yes. of consciousness. Yes. Yeah. You know, the other thing about, you know, life on Earth and living in a body, you know, it, it, it is unique because... You know, it is a planet where you're able to express emotion, you know, I I externally and, and really experience things, you know, in the way that humans do. And, and, and so the whole thing about doing that from the higher part of you, it just amplifies all your talents and aptitudes and abilities, you see. So, of course, if you have certain concepts or attitudes or whatever that just gets in the way, well, then it would be like, you know, putting half a screen over that light over there and it would completely change the dynamics of how you're filming this. You know, but this is what humans do. It's like, well, they wear half of themselves. 
And, and so now you have to wear all of yourselves, you know, who I am, you know, whether, you know, humans like it or not. It's literally about, well, this is what I believe and this is what I think and this is what I do and so on and so forth. And when Blair wrote, don't change the channel and he'd finished the book. He got woken up in the middle of the night and God's voice was saying to him, I want to have the last word in your book. And Blair sort of woke up, what, what? So he had to suddenly get a piece of paper and a pen and write it down because it was coming thick and fast. And what came through was, there will always be people who disagree with who you are, what you think and what you feel and what you do. At times you will be challenged with this. But turning the other cheek is not the answer. There are non-aggressive ways that allow you to stand up to your adversaries. And, and so everyone's going to have an opinion. But the way you respond to that opinion is, is about you. It's not about anyone else. It's about you. So if you respond in a way where you are disempowered, well, then you don't know who you are. You don't believe in who you are. You're listening too much to some story, other people's story. And when you listen to your own story, <clears throat> which is a productive one, well, then you, you expand your consciousness. You turn your lights on for yourself. And okay, that doesn't mean that it's still not going to get people judging you and all that sort of stuff. But when it happens, it's like, oh, big deal. I'm God. You know, I know how it works. And, and but people who do that, well, then that's telling you a lot about them. If they have to make criticisms or judgments and all that sort of stuff. Well, you are often ask the question is, what is someone doing personally? Mm. And we see it in this society at the moment, particularly in the online space, trolling and people putting or spewing out negative content mm. or yep. negative comments rather yep. to others. Yeah. You have to ask yourself the question, what are they doing towards themselves? Well, they're just souls without the lights on, that's all. Mm. Mm. You know, and, and simple as that. And the moment you turn a light on, then you realize, oh, hang on a minute, what am I doing? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Why am I doing that? And, and, and you know, the more that you have awareness, the more you become conscious of the repercussions of your thoughts and actions and words and deeds. And, and, and so, I mean, conflict only comes about because human nature isn't aware. And, and so when the awareness happens, then you have that balance and that harmony. You know, particularly when you understand that, you know, what Peter was saying before about, you know, the way you wear yourself. So if you wear yourself as God, well then, you know, there's no way you're going to go out there and, and dish the dirt or, or, or be negative or, or whatever the case is. Because you know that's going to come smacking you back in your face at some point. And who wants to smack in the face? <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Dolores Cannon described in her books and i'm sure you're familiar with the mm. the material that we almost come into this life uh wearing a costume or a persona mm. me and blair spoke mm. about this earlier is that the way you see it from your perspective is that we take on a persona or we put mm. on a costume we yep. play out a particular yep. role and then we see leave. from this perspective you're out in spirit and you make a decision to be alive again so you gather a group of souls together, and these souls help you to look at the deal that's going to become your life. And they look at other incarnations you've had, they look at your connection with other souls that you were going to reincarnate with, etc. So as you put the deal together, and that's going to be my father, that's going to be my mother, I'm going to be that sex, I'm going to be that country, that's going to be my personality, look at all the things that you want to unfold. And then you're born. And then the moment you're born, it all starts. So, so there's no mistaking any experience. You're exactly where you created yourself to be. Whether that's, you know, the best possible position or the worst. You know, it's exactly the reality that you want to experience because it gives you an opportunity to wake up to yourself. And so you look, you know, at times where humans have gone through so much adversity, if only to open up doors and become amazing. But then you can get the opposite too. People who start off, you know, amazing and start off being miserable. And, and, and so, and nothing that's wrong or right, but it's the way you organize your life, through your thoughts, through your feelings. But of course, human nature <clears throat> can be so hugely influenced by each other. I mean, think about it. For the first five years of your life, your life is pretty much defined by the thoughts and patterns and experiences of other people. And then you grow up, you start thinking for yourself, you have your own experiences, and you go, oh, hang on a minute. 
You know, I don't have to think that. I don't have to feel that. So often that becomes a bit of a battle. You know, often you know, your parents go, I don't want you to do this. This is what I want for you. This is how I need you to be. You know, and who hasn't had that experience? And, and so, but then when you really integrate, particularly mind, body, spirit, then you realize that, oh, hang on a minute, they're not just my parents, they're God's doing it their way. I have choice. And again, you don't have to go and, and publicize the fact. It's a wonderful phrase. Truth needs no publicity. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, it's just, just be yourself. And as like I said, you know, always there are going to be people who are going to disagree with that. And you don't have to go fight them. Because if you fight people, then that's not you believing in yourself. If you know who you are, you know where you stand, then, you know, okay, I hear that. You, but you still get out there and be more and do more and create more, basically. And history is full of opportunities and, and, and situations which has shown that. You know, people in adversity just keep moving forward, basically. And, and so, you know, as I look at humanity now, they've pushed through what was. And having done so, you're in a bigger space now, in a lighter space. And you've got to stand in that space for a moment and realize that, oh, I'm completely free of what was. I pushed all through that, and now I'm brand new. Oh, what should I do with it? Oh, nothing. Just stand still for a moment. Get your bearings. You know, just orientate yourself a little bit. And I can assure you that when it's necessary, you'll take a step. And there will always be that which will guide and assist you. But humans want to plunge into a situation all of the time. Not needed, not necessary. And that puts so much pressure on people. And then they end up having to backtrack sometimes. And that's why at the moment, I think it's very much about um, to stand still. You know, like I said yesterday, be a big observer. And as an observer, then you get a sense of, all right, what? And this is actually very indicative to, to right now and in these next months. What makes the most sense to me right now? And then everyone's story is different in that sense. So. Mm. Because I suppose there's no ultimate truth. It's ranges of perception, mm. right? We, the way we see ourselves today, I, I would imagine the way I see myself right now will mm. be very different than it will be in five or well, I hope ten so. years down the track. <laughs> <laughs> Well, unfortunately, we age, so we all, I'll be looking different, that's for sure. Why do you say unfortunately? Well, I think, you know, certainly from our culture, we've been conditioned, mm. you know, to I know, I'm just, see aging just as a you. negative. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, we all want to look good, right? Hey, look, you know, think about it. You know, my time, all those thousands of years ago, people lived a lot longer. How long did they typically live for? Well, the average then? age could be... You know, in the 200s. Wow. You know, but of course, you know, in my day, people you didn't have the same distractions. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, the atmosphere was, was different. The vibration, you know, was different. There wasn't that collective demand. You know, we didn't have the internet and, mm -hmm. and you know, people telling us what to do and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I'm not saying it was just about survival, but there was a truth of simplicity that made things uncomplicated. Mm. Human nature seems to keep finding more ways of creating more complications, you see. And, and, and so if you keep things in perspective, well then you can reorganize that energy. But if you don't, then it just all gets all tangled up. And, and so this big untangling that's occurred is getting you back to, you know, that, that clearer space. So there's a freedom in some ways in my time that you humans would never have experienced. And it was interesting, Blair was talking to a mate of his the other day, and you know, they were both born in 1960. And, and Blair just said, wow, I'm so glad I was born at this time because we were still able to experience life before everything got too complex and complicated. Mm. You know, there was still a sense of respect. There was still a sense of almost a naivety in, in, in a way, you know, growing up in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And, you know, massive shift of consciousness around the 90s, you know, as a whole different collective way of, of thinking came about, a lot of conflicting energies and vibrations as such, you see. So things started to get a lot heavier. And, and so, but yeah, there's a, a, a corner that has been turned for sure. But, you know, as you say that, mm -hmm. it, it makes me think of, 
you know, we, we haven't necessarily reached a better place in how we interact with each other, how we communicate, how we value each other, even though we are evolving. People might say, for example, people used to be a lot politer, they would use manners more. Now there's a brashness. Well, I think humanity has learned how to disengage with themselves. You know, and you have to look at, you know, the way people with their phones and their pods and their whatevers, you know, their i, what are they, the iPhones and the iPads and the odd pods. And uh, I think humans have to realize they have to create an I can <laughs> and I will yeah. <laughs> and I know. Yeah. You know, that's what has to happen, you see. And, and uh, again, I think it's, it's a lack of respect for life, you know, and people being afraid of that integration and, and, and that vibration and that energy. And that, that comes about through the collective consciousness, and therefore it's manifested in this particular way. And, and so, what is that phrase that was written, you know, one can send the man to the moon, but you can't walk across the road to say hello to your neighbor. <laughs> You know, and human well, nature. It's true. Yeah, it I mean, is true. Yeah, and humanity creates these beautiful homes that they want to live in, but then they have to barricade themselves. Why do you think then we are so afraid of each other? And it was Nietzsche that said, mm. you know, hell is other people, famously. Yeah. Yeah. Why do we see each other as the so enemy many or the for other? This. Yeah, I, I think it's when you lose sight of yourself, how can you see other people? If you can't engage with who you are, mind, body, and spirit, how is it possible that you can engage, you know, with other people, you know, in harmony and balance? And of course, humans have created systems and rules, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where <coughs> it is all about stuff and things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, of course, I think people are overprotecting their properties and their stuff and, and themselves and so on and so forth. So they begin unconsciously to create other people as the problem. And, 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 and then of course they can blame it on society and all that. But what creates society? Humans do. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but I mean it's a way of playing out stuff as well, giving awareness also. It's not wrong, it's not bad. But, but obviously humanity realizes that, well, you know, we're creating a lot of diversions from what the truth is mm. and of course the truth being you know you're all gods and bodies you know unlimited in, in in your power and and so but some people i don't want to know that i'd just rather drive my mercedes or or live in beverly hills or or you know make x amount of money etc etc and which okay that's fine too well it's a lot more comfortable to be asleep i think you know when i go to sleep at night in bed it's it's comfortable mm. um, yep. I can be unconscious, uh, my body doesn't want to get up in the morning necessarily yep. Yep. when the alarm goes off. It's a lot easier to Yeah, but be. That's, that's a reality you've created. You're not in survival mode like some people do. Mm. You know, but it's all relative to you know, the decision that you made. So getting back to what I said before, you're all creating your reality. So some people will create you know, uh, a fairly good life, some will create something even greater, some will create a very basic life. But it's still that soul saying, I want to experience myself, you know, by living in a hovel in Afghanistan. And someone else might say, I want to experience myself by living in a palace in Germany. And, and, and it's all relative. But, you know, sometimes the person who lived in a palace in Germany had already lived in the hovel in, in, in some other place, you see. And... Well, and, and you look in the world today and you think there's probably more people that aren't living in, mm. you know, conditions that mm. are mm. favorable. Why, mm. why do the majority of humans tend to pick unfavorable conditions for existence? It helps to understand their, their resolution of karma. You know, it puts them into situations or through extremities. You know, they learn emotionally, vibrationally, whatever the case is. But, you know, as you're saying this, I'm thinking, you know, there's enough wealth on this planet if it was proportioned. You know, everyone would, would be in an equal position, basically. And, and, and so, so if you think about, you know, the politics, you know, that go on, you know, that's a human nature perspective. And, and so everyone, every country on this planet is able to help each other. But of course, it's not in the vested interest of some dictators and, and despots, etc., for that to happen. <laughs> because they just want to feather their own nest, so to speak, you see. 
And well, that's happened through human history. And, and yet it's changing. And that's a good thing. Yeah, it is. It's certainly we're seeing the, the beginning of that change. I think it's obvious with people like that are in this room and, and other people that we saw yesterday. They're really ready to make those changes because they've perhaps gone through these lessons. Yeah. Is that what the school, uh, the earth rather, is, mm. is a school? I, I think do, there's a rather, you know, disastrous way of looking at things. I mean, who wants to be at school all the time? You know, and, and look, it's a... Or is it a simulation or a video game? Are these no, no, are analogies. Like it's that. just life, you know, and it's just, you're in this place and you're gods and you have all the power of life available to you. And regardless of your circumstances, you all have choice. And okay, it's relative to your circumstances, but if you look at everyone in this room now, you all have more choices than you actually believe. And, and so, so the more you live in a way where you're in an, an alignment, then you're able to see how you can make those things work for yourself. And sometimes it's a matter of changing your mind, you know, and, and, and just practicing a different methodology. And, and so, so it's, it's not, I'll put it differently, everything is available to everyone all the time. But then what you make available to yourself, you know, it's a bit like, <laughs> I got the picture of being given a card and it's the restricted area of the library. You know, and, and in human terms, that's that. But in higher terms, there's no restrictions. So if you think and live and feel in higher terms, then you're not restricting yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think a good thing for anyone to do at this point would ask themselves that question, how am I restricting myself? physically, emotionally, mentally, etc. And when you ascertain what that is, for goodness sake, you know, don't go and find a therapist. You know, just stand still and think, all right, what's a simple thing I can do or feel or think just to make a difference? Because it's always going to be simple. It's never complex. Humans make it complex. Because so many humans struggle with the human experience. Mm. You know, I hear it almost daily from people how mm. difficult they find yep. Yep. life, other relationships. Mm. Why is that? Well, they just caught up into that story, you know, and it's being bombarded all the time. You know, life is a difficult thing. You've got to struggle. Everyone's having to go through this, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, from my perspective, it's still an individual experience. So you might go through a situation, but then you can still decide how you're going to experience it. Are you going to get on the bus and go with everyone else? Or are you going to say, no, I don't want to ride that bus. I'll just go on my scooter, thank you very much. And, and travel, you know, individually for a while. And, and, and that way you won't get caught up into the collective fear or the collective doubt or whatever the case may be, basically, see. And, and, and so that's where this time is, you know, stand still in your own vibration and your own energy and get a good sense of how you work what you're all about, how you're making this happen, what your story is, you know, and then as you improve your own lot, as they say, then, yeah, at some point you say, yeah, I'll, go on, I'll go on the bus, you know, and, and it might be with a whole lot of people who go, well, who are you? And, and it's like yesterday, it's so funny. So, Blair was at his hotel, you see, and he was coming down to meet you, actually, and the lift opened up, and, and there was like six or seven people in there, and they're all facing like this. So Blair just faced them, you know, he, instead of turning around, and he just faced and he looks at them, and go, well, this is cozy, isn't it? <laughs> and of course, everyone took a step back, <laughs> like, who is this freaky guy? You know, and he just looked at everyone and said, oh, how are you doing? You're having a good day? It's very hot out there, isn't it? Da, 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 all that sort of stuff. And so he engaged with them, but many people couldn't do that. You know, you, you, you didn't follow the etiquette. You're supposed to turn around and stare into the door, you know, as the lift goes down, basically. So I think humanity has to engage with each other more. Okay, you don't have to do it the way what he does it, but, but it, it's, it's how to be comfortable with who you are without pushing people's buttons too much, because then that becomes a whole different story, basically. And you see people who are just, oh, I don't give up, whatever. You know, to say what I want to say and do what I want to do and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, you've got to be sensitive and respectful. But it's quite nice. I mean, if a door opens up like that and people are staring at you, well, the first thing you should say is, oh, hello. You know, because it's obvious what it you is to me. You tend to see <laughs> in um, less condensed areas, people mm. are a little bit more connected. I think of, 
every time I go to a country area, people generally say hello, good morning. Mm. They welcome you in the street. The moment you get to a city, a bigger place, there's less connection. It seemed the more densely populated we are. Well, that's because people are focused on their journey or their event or their situation, etc. And 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 the collectivity of a city is just so full of a tangle. And 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 therefore, you know, they don't want to engage with or they get suspicious. You know, if you say some hello to someone in New York, they'll sort of look at you like That's you probably know. exactly yep. true. Yep. It's yep. it's it's suspicion yes. that sorry, that's, I don't know if that is gonna we'll cut that. Anyway, <laughs> no, keep it in. It'll be light have, relief. Let me just have a bit of water here because my throat is a bit dry. Yeah, I'll have mm. some water too for Blair's body. Help his, help his throat. Mm. Do you need me to clap or anything to no. sync anything up? Okay. Um, I think suspicion is a, is a really good word. It's, it's the number one thing people think about. Mm. I, if I'm open, if I, if I do it differently, if I don't follow the program, mm. people are going to think I'm weird, they're going to be yep. suspicious of me. Yep. And it's probably a true way of looking at it. Yep. Yeah. And again, that, that says a lot about what collective, the collective story is all about. You know, if someone is kind to you, people automatically assume you have a motive. And, and, and so, you know, but you, you can't, if you know yourself, you just have to be yourself. And, and, and therefore, it's not stopping yourself from saying hello to people. And I think it takes a lot of courage to be able to just be yourself on this planet. I found as I've gotten older, mm. I've tended to care less and less of what other people think about me and yes. more about how I think of myself. Excellent, good. And that seems to be yes. synonymous with development yeah. and yeah. evolution. Yeah. But I think also, too, a lot of humans think, well, uh, I want to play the game or I don't want to stand out or um, I want to make sure that I'm approved. You know, so that's why humans go and adapt themselves to suit other people rather than just be themselves. Mm. And, and, you know, human nature, it's like no one wants to stand alone over there. But there's a lot of power and, and, and aptitude in doing that. Because from that perspective, you're able to be a much better observer of everything. And then you have a selective process. I, I personally call it having life by invitation only. So you literally invite in who you want in your life, what you want to do in your life, where you want to go in your life. And again, it takes a lot of courage to do that. How often do people think, you know, oh, well, I'll go and give it a go and see what happens. As opposed to, no, I actually don't want to do that. You know, and, and, and so... They go and make themselves go somewhere or do something or whatever. It's completely against their, their nature. Simply because, oh, I don't want to be seen in a bad light. Or, you know, or if someone says, oh, well, if you don't do this, then Uncle Henry's going to be all upset. And that I don't, you got to uh, invite Aunt Iris to your wedding. But I've never met her. Doesn't matter. She's your Aunt Iris. You know? <laughs> and, and so, so people create these rules and complications like tying up all these knots. All of the time, basically. And you probably think in 5,000 <laughs> years, not a lot has evolved with oh, look, human nature that in a lot of ways. Well. That's You're what, I'm, so that's what I'm thinking. Yes. <laughs> but do you think we are making making a evolutionary jump at this time in this No, obviously, generation? you and I would not be talking if that wasn't the case. Yeah. You yeah. know, so there's this exposure to higher consciousness. So humanity is able to open up their whole being to realizing, well, this is a new normal. Did humanity have to evolve in order to survive? Is that what this time is about? Is this a, a such a significant event that we mm. needed to evolve, otherwise we faced our own annihilation Correct. or extinction? Yep. Yeah. So I mean, that the, is earth, what the earth occurred. itself would survive. Yeah. You know, so that just on goes. And see. I think that's the narrative from government yep. to yep. spirituality. Yep. Correct. We yep. all recognize yep. that. Do you think yep. we... But that's gone through history, though, Paul. If you think of many, many, many times through the whole history of this planet, there's always been times where humanity's been on the brink of its own annihilation. But then catalysts have happened to make people wake up to something. Or there even have been events where, you know, other earth changes and things of that nature have annihilated, you know, mass populations, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you know, it comes down to that whole thing. When you get things out to balance, then you've got to do a bit of clearing, basically. See. Mm. Are we too populated as a planet? 
No, you're not too populated, but it's the way you've populated your thoughts and, and attitudes, etc., that creates all the problems. Mm -hmm. and, and, but, you know, it's interesting too, and I've noted this, um, there's so many fertility issues that are occurring at this particular point. That's a... And, and that's a natural way of ensuring the slowing down of population growth. Wow, so that, that's the mm. intelligence. Yes, of course. So that is one of the reasons course, why absolutely. that's occurring, because no. a lot of people have put that down to dieting or modern society, no, no, or yes. waiting to a certain yes. age to yep. actually yes. yep. try to conceive. Yes. Yep. Yep. And of course you get those who are living in awareness, many young people who are choosing not to have children because they're too conscious of, of the way things are at this particular point and they mm. don't want to bring a child into such uncertainty. Mm. And of course they don't want to uh, feel that they're adding to the issues and adding to the problems. Mm. So there's always natural ways of culling, I suppose you could call it, or that selective process. Again, life by invitation only. Mm. But it's no one doing it to us. There's no group out there no, that's trying to no, 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 manipulate. No. Or... no, there's no ET craft hovering <laughs> around there, beaming lasers at you to stop you from having babies. Or an evil cabal somewhere <laughs> that's trying to disempower us no, at no, some level. No, no. It, it's all to do with yourselves. You know, you're the one who's in charge of your life. You're the one who is experiencing your own realities. And I know there's lots of theories about, you know, extraterrestrials who are, this is an experiment on the planet and all this stuff is happening. Et cetera, so many et cetera, theories. Et yeah, <laughs> yeah. But in reality, it, it, it's just, okay, here you are, this state of consciousness, and, and you know, you're exploring and adventuring and creating and, and making it all happen, basically, you see. And I mean, if you think about it, the fact that, you know, we think about all the craziness and madness and how many people are on the planet, et cetera, et cetera, and how it actually works most of the time. You know, when you think about it, you think there would be more mayhem than there is. So, so from our perspective, that is a great indicator of the power that you all possess. You know, that you've got these billions and billions of people on this planet, and you're making it work. You know, despite the conflicts and the inequalities and the imbalances and stuff, you still manage to make it work. Mm. Mm. And, and so, so you've got to look at that and go, yeah, that's true. Wow, we're pretty powerful, aren't we? You know? so, so therefore, you're all holding it together, because you are, in the way you think, in the way you feel, in the way you, you live. So if you do turn on your God light, then you're just going to hold it together even better. Mm. And, and it's just going to bring an even greater energy and harmony. So it's all about finding that new balance. Mm. <laughs> so are you optimistic for the planet? Always, yes. There's a lot of fear at the moment in society from, from the science community to different communities to probably, we are becoming more conscious yep. of the effect that we're having on the planet. Yep. Do you think we're gonna make it? Oh yes, absolutely. But there's a phrase, science with the knowledge of God is productive. Science without the knowledge of God is destructive. As individuals, your life with the knowledge of your higher nature is going to be productive. Without it, it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of bringing all the right formulas together. And typically, we haven't been great stewards of the planet for the last at least hundreds of years, particularly as technology has advanced. Yes. Yeah. We've become more destructive yeah. to the well, you planet. See, because you created systems where it's all about taking and not giving. You know, in the exploitation of each other, of, of, of the land, of the air, of everything. You know, it's just a matter of, you know, what can we do to make money out of this or to profit from this, basically, mm. see. And that's a consciousness, right? Yes. That's a, a, a being a corporate yeah. consciousness. Yeah. It's, it's trickled yeah. down into yeah. the personal but life. As humanity's needs increase then, you know, more and more exploitation comes about to supply humanity, you know, with, with, with those needs and all that sort of stuff. Mm. You know, when you think about, you know, the materialism on this planet, you know, I, for some reason, think about $2 shops, you know, and you go into... <laughs> There's a lot of them. It's like, <laughs> you know, who needs this stuff and such, you see? And it's that whole throwaway society as well. 
So humans got used to, I want, I want, I can, and so they just take, 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 take. And, and without even realizing that they're living without a conscience. So if you live with a conscience and you'll think, well, actually, no, I don't need to do that or, or you know, buy that for the sake of that or whatever. You know, and, and, and so, you know, and I know people making a stand they, so they won't buy products that have got palm oil in it because of the way that they're decimating the jungles so that they can, you know, grow more palm oil trees, etc. Et it's a great so, example to yeah, use, yeah, I think. Yeah. So humanity is becoming more, but not enough. Mm. Mm. You know, and, and you know, you, this is where you start to imbalance the ecosystems. So, so everything is there and created to sustain everything. And even humanity, you know, you're just part of nature. And, and so, so if you play your part appropriately, then it, it keeps everything in balance, you see. Mm -hmm. and, and so, again, there's no rocket science. You know, it's just a matter of have a conscience about who you are and what you're thinking. And so every time you even think about negative thoughts about yourself and, and, and put yourself down or, or, or doubt or fear, you know, that is creating a problem for the world. Yeah. And we do create our reality through our thoughts, our words, which solidify in our experience. They become our reality. We're so much more powerful than we give ourselves credit for, aren't we? Well, think of what I said before. If you look at how the world actually does work, well then, yeah, you can see the power that is being played out by the fact that every individual has, has a role to play and you're all making this work. So you are making it work. But of course, evolution is, is what's natural. Mm. And, and so, you know, when people talk about power, again, they would tend to look at it in human terms. When I think of the word power, I think about the acknowledgement and the recognition of what you are and what is available to you all of the time. You know, right now, all of us here, you know, we all got access to everything right now. You know, we may not see what that is, but it's just here. Mm. And it's not to be found. It's to be acknowledged. It's to be aligned. And, and then in the day that you live, in the moment that you, you have, uh, you experience that. And then you decide what to do with it, how to direct it, you see. Mm. You don't have to think about it in the terms of, you know, what, what is ahead of oneself. It's more about what are the experiences that I'm having right now and how shall I use the power of life right now so that therefore I have the best experience possible. Mm. Why do we create illness in our bodies? Well, illness, dis-ease, is because you're diseased, you're out of ease. You know, so anything to do with disharmony, disease, distress, etc., etc., it's because your mind, body, spirit isn't in alignment. Is it a message? No, it's from... not a message. It's it, it, it's a a symptom of 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 out of out of sync uh, when you get out of balance, basically. See, mm. and and so so when you feed your mind, feed your body, feed your spirit, and you are aligned 100 percent to yourself as higher consciousness, then you're able to just tap into that power we spoke of, and then on a cellular level. Well, then you will be in well-being, you will be in light of oneself. And even with children, I mean, mm. this is a contentious issue for a lot of people. Why would children be born with certain conditions? No, this is karmic. Karmic. That's all it is. It's is it a, generally from yeah. past life mm. or to do Not with Not necessarily. Parents? Sometimes the soul will decide, I'm going to be born you know, disabled, whether it's mentally or physically, etc., because it gives me an opportunity to evolve and, and to develop, but also give other people a chance to grow and develop. I remember many, 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 many years ago in New Zealand, there was this little girl who was a baby. When she was a baby, she was given a blood transfusion, and the blood was uh, tainted with HIV. And, and, and so she was actually born here in Australia. But then in the 80s then, you know, they, they wouldn't have a bar of her. When she grew up, they weren't allowed to go to school, etc. Et so she came to New Zealand. And therefore, she was embraced. Her name was Eve Van Grofthuis. So she lived a very short life, but she became this advocate for for HIV and with children, and 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 you know that soul that was her message, and 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 she did a huge amount to bring an awareness, you know, about that disease and and about how people's responses and reactions were basically. Mm. Well, we get so caught up in the illusion mm. and the disasters mm. and so on but when you see yourself as an eternal soul 
then the, the, the impermanence, so to speak, mm. it, it's not so serious. I mean, people uh, fear death so much that they forget to live. Yeah. That's what probably yeah. our biggest thing that yeah. we find. Yeah. Well, I mean, death is just a state of consciousness. Mm. But also, too, you know, if you don't believe in your soul, well, then, of course, you think if this is all there is... Which so many people believe, let's yeah, be yeah. really honest. Yeah, yeah. So and many people don't know or they yep. say they don't know what yes. happens. Yep. And because of the unknown, people are afraid of yep. Yep. what they can't touch and see and yeah. Well, you experience. know, they'll find out. <laughs> what, a, what a hard lesson for so many people is that they live their life fearing something that probably maybe that's a choice maybe that that is the wisdom they need to understand you know and of course they go out of their bodies and they go oh oh yeah okay hmm. and 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 so but i i think what i said before about everyone creates their story before they're born so if you want to come with ignorance, if you want to come with fear of death and so on and so forth, well then there's an opportunity to grow and, and, and evolve. Mm. And, and, and so, and then when you finally move away from this physical body and you realize, well, you know, nothing to fear. You know, it's like the story I was telling before about that woman whose son died and, and she went to spirit and, and, and saw that, hey, everything was okay. And I mean, she's a very spiritual person. So, but I mean, this is the thing about living on this planet you have all these opportunities to be so diverse in your emotions and your thoughts and your experiences. And it's all wonderful. Even the most misery gut stuff. <laughs> you know, when you look at it from a God perspective, it's, oh, look at that soul. How amazing that they're learning through such adversity. You know, rather than see, oh, how terrible and how tragic and how awful. It's, oh, wow, look at these gods. They're doing it that way. Mm. Well, human beings tend to learn best through adversity. I've heard it said many times that we tend mm. to, when well, that, things that, are going yeah. really well in our lives, we're too distracted and in the moment of enjoying yes, it. Yes, it's too good to be true. Something bad's got to happen. <laughs> that, we, that we almost welcome or yep. expect into our experience something that's going to yeah. challenge us more. Well, it's a belief system. That's all. You know, I mean, when people say to me, oh, Tabash, you know, well, you know, life never works that way, da, da, da. You don't have to take the good and the bad. And I say, well, it's up to you. You take it the way you want to. It's up to you. It's entirely up to you. Mm. You know, God didn't say here, you know, sometimes you've got to be happy and sometimes you have to be miserable. Mm. God said, here, here's life. Go and do something with it. Mm. Mm. And some will choose the belief system, you know, no pain, no gain. And some will think, hey, you know, if I'm a God and a body, it's up to me. You know, and I don't have to always learn through adversity. You know, I can learn through life. Or love. Yes, and happiness and all those sorts of wondrous energies. So, so it's a choice. One of the things that <clears> profoundly <throat> stuck with me that you, Tabash, said yesterday was that heaven isn't so much a literal place. It's a state of consciousness. And that heaven can be found in the embrace of a partner, in the you know, interaction with, with, with a pet with sitting and in enjoying everything. nature and yeah, it really yeah. yep. put into perspective for yes. me yes. is that i believe this is what jesus when he walked the earth yes. was really pointing towards because he said that the kingdom of, of heaven, heaven is, is within, within yep. even though <clears throat> religion has pushed the narrative that it's a literal place we go yep. when yep. we depart this reality that people of that time their intellect was such where that's what they believed and that's what they understood. Did they need that at the time? Because that was the perhaps um, limitation or... No, that was a collective truth at the time. Yeah. But of course, as time has progressed, <clears throat> people have educated themselves into understanding what they are. So of course, you realize that it is a state of consciousness, as I, as I say. And therefore, why not just live in heaven all the time? Why wait till you die? <laughs> mm. You know, why not have it right now? Mm. You know, humans talk about the heaven on earth. And I'm not talking about just a paradisical place that looks like a nice garden. Mm. You know, it, it, it's the heaven of your happiness and your joy and your alignment. And, and, or I think perhaps the heaven of knowing you are in charge. Knowing that you are doing the driving. Knowing you have choice. Mm. And that you don't have to put up with stuff or this is the way life works, etc. It's about, no, 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 I'm standing in this place. This is what I've created. This is how I'm making all of this work. 
And, and, but, you know, for a lot of people, that's a big responsibility. You know, I think, you know, I'd rather someone else tell me what to do because mm. I don't have it in me to, to, you know, lead myself or direct myself in such a way. And that's okay too. But invariably, everyone will get there. Yeah. And it's, it's a wonderful journey to be on when you see it as that, of a course. journey. Yep. And when you come to the place of embracing yourself because we're really the only one having the experience aren't we even though we see the uh individual bodies yes yep are we all the same consciousness yes we are because everything is god yeah and yet think about it from this per se i've created you as my reality mm. so that i could have this interchange with you you've created me as your reality We've all created everyone else in this room as a reality too, mm. so they could part, they play their parts. But in, in all reality, it's just our own experience, our own personal experience. Yeah. And then we'll so just we, take it away and do whatever we wish, we wish to do with it. And this is what you mean by we are gods mm. of our own experience. Yep. We, yep. as Dolores Cannon said, yes. we are the writer of our own scripts, yep. the director of our own movies. Absolutely. Yep. What can someone expect seeing you in person i know you're going to be in sydney in <laughs> um february it's a it, it's very um energetic for the people that are there isn't it N nothing is ever the same when i talk to people you know obviously I, you know i want to share some really important universal truths that are so in, important for for people to understand, like presenting keys to understand how consciousness works. But I do always a scan of the, of the group and I sort of make a decision at the time about collectively what needs to be heard and so on and so forth, basically. So I never plan. Well, and you give, and you did this yesterday, you give mm. people in the audience personal messages. Sometimes, I don't do that all the time. You, yep, you, yep. you made your way But I understand the... I have to play the game. <laughs> well, I think a lot of people like that because people yep. want answers for their own life. Yep, yep. What I witnessed yesterday mm. was so many people in their own profound ways getting those mm. messages, whether it was individual yep. Yep. or they were relating to someone else yep. that you were directly yep. communicating Well, you know, sometimes with. you just have to go and reach in, oh, no, you don't need that anymore, flick that off, <laughs> you know, and suddenly people have a, a reaction and a response and, and a catharsis of some point, basically, mm. see. But, look, everyone needs to hear truths. And so the truth of today will be different from the truth of the middle of February. You know, things will evolve at, at that particular point. So. Yeah. And I know that Blair offers, um, and we'll talk about that later when you go, um, just the practicality of, of how you work, but you will be coming. And hopefully you'll be traveling a little bit this year around the mm. world and being mm. more made available. Are you getting that sense no, as you're operating plan. through Blair yep, that you're... Yep that you've reached a new phase in your... Mm. Um, well, we've always done the travel, you know, prior to COVID, we were traveling quite a bit. And, but yeah, you know, you, you, you go where you need to go. It's ramping say. up again. Yeah. yeah. How would you like to leave us today? Would you like to leave <clears throat> us with a final message? Be true to yourself. But in being true to yourself, see how many selves that you are. And every day, why not discover another self that you can be true to? Every day, have a relationship with a self that you've never had a relationship with before. And in doing so, see what a grand and wondrous opportunity you will give to yourself because of that. Be true to yourself each day. Stand still. Be in heaven. And find more and create one. But also know that you're never alone. And you are greatly loved. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. I'll bring Blair back. Okay. Bye for now. <clears throat> Welcome back. Hello. <laughs>